The West uh, is, uh, roughly speaking, a civilizational term rather than a political concept. Uh, and it has very little uh, unity, which in certain circumstances is, a, is an advantage rather than a disadvantage. But the interests of the countries that uh, make it up, uh, as you no doubt have noticed recently, are, are very uh, different and sometimes conflicting. Moreover, there's disagreement not only uh, between countries, but within countries uh, themselves. And I think we're living in a time in, wi in which uh, uh, political legitimacy uh, has been lost, not least in our own country, but also in countries like France. Um, we, secondly, we live at a time when pop populations value uh, comfort and consumption more than anything else. And I'm uh, not uh, absolving myself from these strictures. I quite like comfort uh, myself. But these are, this is not a very uh, advantageous or auspicious circumstance from which to demand sacrifices from a population. And uh, we uh, supposedly sympathize very deeply with the Ukraine, but I wonder how far that sympathy will go uh, if the lights go out and there's no heating and so on, how long that sympathy will last. Um, third, the idea that the West is or could have been a hegemon forever is nonsense in my view. Uh, since uh, the organized, systematic, and institutionalized testing of nature, known as science, it's a, a completely Western um, invention, but it is universal. And uh, it was, uh, in my view, inevitable that other nations, other peoples, uh, would uh, catch up. And, uh, and a good example of that is Japan after the arrival of Commodore Perry. Uh, it was amazing how quickly actually it caught up. Fourth, perhaps a, some kind of existential crisis would bring us all together, but the chances of that happening uh, before it is too late, I think, are rather small. Uh, it will be five minutes to midnight at the latest, and I don't think we are there now. I don't think we believe, actually, uh, that we are in an existential crisis. Uh, fifth, we were asked whether conflict uh, in the 20, if there will be a serious conflict in the 20th century and uh, 21st century, and if the past three millennia are anything to go by, the answer is yes. Um, I hope the answer is no, but I think the answer is yes because we are conflictual animals. And finally, let me recommend to you, if you don't know the play by Max Frisch, uh, The Fire Raisers, let me recommend that to you as a wonderful metaphorical um, uh, exploration of our current uh, situation, uh, which, I, uh, of course, he wrote about 60 or 70 years ago, but is a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, play uh, which will illuminate our current situation. Thank you very much. Tulip, is the age of the West now truly over? Thanks very much. I was thinking about this on the way and um, on the train over here. And what I would say is that I was looking at the way the West reacted, sorry, to the invasion of Ukraine by Putin. And I have to say, I saw the West reacting in a way that is in a very coordinated fashion. And whether that was supplying medical aid, whether that was arms, whether that was ammunition, whether that was um, anti-tank, whether that was collecting refugees, and I say collecting because the government didn't do much, it was individual people looking on websites, finding people and then housing refugees. And as a constituency MP, I've seen a lot of work in that. I saw the West pulling together in a fashion that I haven't seen for a long time. And I, don't, I think when Putin invaded Ukraine in the bloody manner that he did, he expected a lot more disunity. So for, so for me, without sounding like I'm always so optimistic, I actually did see the West pulling together and I did see them reacting in a way that Putin probably didn't expect. President Macron in 2019 described NATO as brain dead. But I think at this point, if you think about the way the NATO alliance is working, I think it'd be very hard to question the integrity and effectiveness of what NATO has been doing and all the people working together. I think it's had a bit of a rebirth, actually, in the after um, effects of what's happened in the war. 
And I hope countries like Finland who are applying to join it, they do get their application um, accepted. But I'm not naive. I don't think just because we reacted well and better than I expected in the aftermath of the war or during the war, it doesn't mean that we've kind of <laughs> reached every conclusion we could and everything's fine. I think what NATO has to do now when we need to look at this is we need to look at how it stops from becoming a crisis management alliance to actually responding to whatever the next invasion is, because I think they probably will be another invasion by Putin. Obviously, we don't know what it is, but it also needs to look at the military assistance that it can give to Ukraine as we move forward. And of course, we've got to look at the cuts of the British Army. We've got to look at how we defend ourselves. But I think if we strengthen the relationships we have in the NATO alliance, and if we look at how we can work together, I don't feel as dismal as people are making it out to be about the West being in decline. I think there's a lot of good um, relationships that are being created. I think we're doing a lot of good work. Um, most recently, we were in Parliament when the Ukrainian leader Zelensky addressed us, and it was a historic moment to be in Parliament with him hiding in a bunker, basically, and telling us what's happening in his country looking like a man who has lived through a war, talking about what had happened to the children, to the grandmothers who are trying to escape, to babies, to women who are suffering war crimes. And he talked about how much his allies and how much support he had received from people in the West. And he thanked the prime minister, and many of you will know I'm not a fan of the prime minister, but he thanked the prime minister, he thanked the United Kingdom, and he said it was the allies who were supporting him. And that's how we're going to reach the end of the war, is if we all support Zelensky and Ukraine. So for me, in a way, I'm looking at the West, I'm looking at countries like Germany who were a bit um, hesitant about putting sanctions on Russia, who have now tried to stop their reliance on oil and gas from Russia. So I think there is a movement from the West to pull together when one of us is being attacked. So I'm a bit more optimistic. It's not usual for politicians to be like that, but I feel a bit more optimistic about the West. We welcome it. Thank you, Tulip. Nigel, is the age of the West now truly over? Well, um, I think the, you know, the first thing to say is that the West's uh, global domination, if you look at this uh, across you know, the long durée of history, um, goes, as they say in Match of the Day, against the run of play because we really only imposed ourselves on and shaped you know, the institutions of the modern world um, from the late 18th century, the 19th century. Um, and if you look um, at um, most of history, there were two countries, India and China, that between them accounted for about 50% of the world's total global economic activity. It's hardly surprising, uh, given um, all the things that have happened in the interim, that you know, this equation is rebalancing itself and that we're seeing a shift of power from west to east. You know, th th this, is, uh, um, you know, this is not something we should be surprised at. Chinese leaders are fond of saying these days, uh, the east is rising, the west is in decline. And as with everything to do with the Chinese Communist Party, they're sort of half right. Uh, there's no question that there is this transfer uh, is taking place. But, and this is the important thing, this is not a zero-sum game. The fact that uh, countries like China, India, uh, countries of Southeast Asia, Japan, uh, South Korea are you know, gaining ground, you know, becoming more prosperous, becoming more globally influential does not necessarily mean that the West you know, suddenly you know, gets cancelled out. Um, I was very interested to read this morning um, a piece by a gentleman uh, by the name of Professor Wang Ji Se, who is uh, China's foremost American expert, and he made the point that you know, we can conclude that the United States is in decline when we no longer see long queues of people outside American consulates wanting to study there, work there, live there. Yeah. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two, 
Um, we are unquestionably moving um, into, from a period of relative low entropy after the end of the Cold War into a period of high entropy. You know, no question about that. It may not seem that way if you live in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, but generally speaking, during the 1990s and 2000s, globally, we were able to actually build institutions, reinforce organizations, and now we're seeing that process moving somewhat into reverse. You know, we've probably hit gl peak globalization, but this is not to say this is the end of globalization. I think it's more that globalization henceforth will take on a different character from what it has had. Um, and you know, finally, you know, in relation to the West, I would say essentially we have enjoyed a kind of 40-year holiday from geopolitics. And that holiday is now coming to an end. Um, and we are having to rethink some long-held assumptions about you know, the validity of an approach that is based on soft power, on economics, which is very much what the European Union is all about, and coming to terms with the reality that state-on-state -state conflict is back. The, the security threats we've had to deal with up until now have largely been um, posed by non-state actors, but that is now shifting and you know, we're, we're back in the game. Um, I think you know, the, the performance of the Russian military um, in Ukraine demonstrated that their much vaunted military modernization was in many ways a Potemkin exercise. You know, lots of nice facades, but not much going on behind it. And that if it came to a straight contest between NATO and Russia, Russia would clearly lose. And we should take comfort from that. Um, but at the same time, um, I think we, you know, we do need you know, to learn some lessons and, and we'd rather lost sight of the fact that I never know who said this, that the, you know, the price of peace is eternal vigilance. We do need, as Tulip said, to, to um, reinvest in security capabilities. I say this with feeling because in the decade at the end of the Cold War, my former organization was cut by 25% such that when real problems kicked off uh, in the early 2000s, we were simply not um, manned or equipped to deal with them as we would wish. So I think you know, we, we need to um, invest in these capabilities. The business community are slowly and painfully coming to terms with the reality that uh, powerful though they are, politics... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.